do you how do you determine your topics? Uh, good questions. Uh, I guess it, it's got to come from the heart for me. Uh, I've uh, I've always loved baseball, and uh, I uh, and I love history, and uh, and and I like people, <laughs> and you know baseball history and people. That's uh, there's a lot to choose from. But it, something has to really grab me. Like, you know, I felt Branch Rickey hadn't been written on for a long time. It, it, it is in our country, it, it has been to me, a way of life. A charming challenge that comes from, from a little object. A little round ball made up of rubber inside and the yarn about it and horsehide cover with 162 stitches or what have you. What is it that would challenge the interest of a man for 58 years? I tell you, it has blessed me. I bless it. I had a sympathy and a uh, distance from him because uh, in my first book was on the, the labor history, almost a player's history of baseball and how they were underpaid for over a century. And Ricky was a foil in that book because he believed in the reserve system. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the course of writing the book, I, I, um, I learned a lot more, I got more sympathetic to him. And I found out, since I like to dig deep, I found out that uh, he belonged to the same public question club in St. Louis as su a future Supreme Court Justice Wiley Rutledge. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, uh, and then of course Rutledge went on the Supreme Court and so I decided, I knew that John Paul Stevens had an interest in baseball and so I wrote him and I got two letters back from him and he said he didn't know Rutledge uh, uh, on the public question club, but Steve Stevens had represented the uh, uh, anti, uh, the, the, it was a committee to investigate the antitrust violations in baseball, because they have that rare antitrust violation, uh, exemption rather. And he said he was stunned that Branch Rickey really believed that if ball players were free to go anywhere, there would be, uh, the competition wouldn't be as good. And, and I, I respected that, you know, and, uh, and then when the book came out, uh, a friend of mine uh, was in a, um, uh, a, 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 at the dentist, and she was reading an L magazine from two years ago. And uh, there was an interview with Justice Ginsburg, I believe conducted by the woman who wrote the biography, Notorious B.I.G. Mm. So uh, they, she, the interviewer said, what book have you been reading lately? And she said, well, I've been reading this amazing book about Branch Rickey. I had no idea what he put up with. So since she had gone as little as Ruth Bader to my cousin's camp, I, I, I sent her a letter and I got a very, very nice note wow. back and we shared our love of opera. And you know, in, in this, so baseball, uh, I wish I had played and, I, and I, as I look back, uh, my career which never started is definitely over. I might have made some pact with the devil to maybe give up a few brain cells and may, maybe even more uh, parts of the body if I was able to hit line drives into the gap with, with any regularity. You're quoted in Sports Illustrated as saying, they call us baseball nuts, but they forget that a nut is a very fine fruit. <laughs> yes, that, uh, I don't think you could get away with that today, but <laughs> that was 1984 in, in, uh, at a uh, Sabre conference, Society for American Baseball Research that I belong to for 40 years. and. Uh, I was lucky because I, uh, well, I never played. I mean, I wasn't lucky in that I didn't grow up near fields and I grew up in the heart of New York where there were not many kids my age and I had protective parents, but they would take me to baseball games and I grew up when there was the Giants, the Dodgers, and the Yankees. And uh, I was a Giant fan mainly because of my father. I was a loyal 
a obedient kid, and he didn't like the Yankees, and I picked that up. And I didn't really like the Dodgers that much, excepting when they were playing the Yankees, right? And, but I have vivid memories of Bobby Thompson's home run. I know where I was standing. I was nine years old. Well, um, tell me about that, because that is the iconic moment in baseball history. And it was the first televised, nationally televised game. Uh, and uh, I was not listening to Russ Hodges and, you know, talking to you, Greg, and about, you know, the, the phone book and finding someone who's still alive. Well, thanks to somebody, th there was no uh, videotape collected back then. And when they made the, the acetate tapes, when they were done, they threw them out. But some guy uh, had a tape at home of Russ Hodges, the giant announcer, uh, saying it's the bottom of the night, it's 4 2. The, uh, Thompson uh, is at the plate. and. Uh, uh, Hartung and uh, 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 and, and will will and, and Lockman will run like the wind if he gets a hold of one. And then here's the pitch. Then there's a long drive. I think it's going to be the Giants win the pennant. 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 Bobby Dad Thompson uh, gets into lower deck and they're going wild. <laughs> I called my father at his office. I don't think he understood a word I was saying. I, and I, I, you know, the great thing about history and literature it doesn't have to be exactly true. But you know, one of my great mottos is that I'd rather be vaguely right than precisely wrong. <laughs> and and you know, when when I when I watch all the people today, you know, with all these experts and the, these uh, guys with the computers who are taking high positions in baseball. They, they're looking at the computers so much, they're not looking at the game, you know? So that's where the, the, the vaguely right comes from. So that, that's a great memory. And, uh, uh, and when I went to grad school after going to College of Columbia, I, I never lost the love of baseball. And I was in Wisconsin, and I, it, it's funny how these things stick in, in mind. I, in 68, there were a bunch of, it was my last year in grad school, uh, the, the White Sox had moved nine games to Milwaukee, who had lost the Braves to Atlanta. And uh, that was a threat that if you don't get us a new stadium, we're going to leave Chicago. And we, the, I think it was a one nothing game that the White Sox might have beaten the Red Sox. And on the way home, the, we're listening to Nixon's speech at the uh, uh, accepting the Republican nomination in that wild year of 1968. And, and I, I kind of have a clear memory of him saying that the most important civil right is the right to be free of domestic violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. And, and you know the stuff that uh, that comes through, and, and and there's so many you know baseball connections. Uh, so May Snyder Mantle, how was those uh, things sorted out in your neighborhood? Well, as I say, my neighborhood wasn't. I was there weren't many kids, and in, in school we would occasionally have bets uh, uh, on who would get two hits in a game, and and Mays, I think. Uh, it's 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 so hard to to not think that Mays was the most in, incredible player that came along, and he, of course he went into the army, he lost two years in the army, and uh, Mantle, of course, you know, he was the enemy, 
but I, I now respect in, in the retrospect, he did play Hurt, you know, tremendously. And, uh, and he was clutch, you know. And, and Snyder played in a smaller park that was made for his power. But uh, they, they, were, uh, they were all great players, all deservedly in the Hall of Fame. And then in the nostalgia wave of the 80s, it became the song Willie, uh, Mickey and the Duke by Terry Cashman. In, you're doing your research uh, on this ferocious gentleman. Uh, what was the surprise? What was something you said, I went in thinking this, and my God, I'm way over here? Very good question, Greg. And, uh, well, first, the whole concept of ferocious gentleman, you know? I mean, he, w the biggest surprise was his love of play. I mean, I knew his work ethic was off the charts. I mean, you know, and to the point where he had, he broke down with TB, when he was uh, in his 20s and when he recovered, they told him to slow down. So what does he do? He goes to Michigan, gets a law degree in two years while coaching the baseball team. But so I knew about the work ethic, but he had a play ethic and I got to meet a lot of the grandkids and some of the kids. And so, I mean, I really, you know, the uh, coming from a small family myself, that wasn't, uh, you know, a hugging family, uh, I, I really, uh, got very pleasantly surprised and almost overjoyed at the kind of fun that they had, you know, and that the, one of the daughters said you never felt fear around him and another daughter said that uh, he had such fun in his life. Mm -hmm. and, the grand, and, and to the grandkids, you know, he was, you know, he'd be, he'd kiss them in the morning while he had shaving cream on, you know, and he would tell every one of the 20 some odd that you're my favorite grandchild, you know. So, uh, in fact, the f most favorite story f about his fun loving was one of the grandkids told me that they, they got an island uh, when he moved from Brooklyn to Pittsburgh. And, you know, one of the, uh, uh, they warned him, he had had many years of um, uh, disease attacks, you know, and he was, uh, and a TB survivor has always got to be careful, so they told him to slow down. But he wasn't going to, his last act in baseball was, was not going to be being forced out of Brooklyn by Walter O'Malley. So he takes over Pittsburgh, which is a really moribund franchise. But one of the deals is the owner of the team, John, Kenneth, uh, John uh, Galbraith, John W. Galbraith, offers him a deal on an island, on Manitoulin Island in northern Ontario. I think the largest freshwater <laughs> island in the world. And so it was a place where all the kids and the grandkids could gather. And there's a wonderful story about this one day, as beautiful a day as you could ever find. And the parents, the grandparents, the kids, the grandkids, they're all gathered around the lake. And it's so quiet, you know. And then all of a sudden, somebody gets hit with a watermelon seed. And everybody starts accusing everybody else. And then they turn to Grandpa. <laughs> and he had started it. And you know the the story. He couldn't. He didn't like quiet. You know, and that that's why he was always trying to innovate. And so it's that side I tried to bring out while understanding the history and understanding too that you know he made a lot of enemies in baseball because he it, it, he he was very dominant and at times domineering. Well, Branch Rickey, Pittsburgh Pirates, moribund uh, franchise. Uh, he was responsible, I think, for bringing in Joe L. Brown. Uh, as the general manager, which then segues into your other interest in yeah. life, Joe E. Brown. Yes, well, you know, How I... That all connect? Well, you know, Joe L., I interviewed Joe L. twice, not at the time realizing how much I'd be interested in his, his father. Uh, Joe, Joe L. Uh, grew up... Uh, uh, Joe, L., Joe E. Brown had two sons. Uh, Don Brown, the oldest, born 1916, Joe... L. Brown, uh, born in 1918. Uh, Joe, Joe E. Uh, started as an acrobat, leaving his home in Toledo when he was 10 years old. And, and the family could, he was going to earn more money in a circus than his, his father, Joe E.'s father, earned as a house painter. So he liked to say, Joe E. Brown, that the, uh, I'm the only uh, boy who ever ran away to join the circus with his parents' permission. He's, I mean, his, his life is absolutely remarkable. His touring group is in San Francisco in a April 1906 when the earthquake hits. 
So that, and so they're on a rep, they, they, but he made this, you know, the thing about Joe E. Brown and, and that Joe L. and that anyone who wants to succeed in baseball, you have to make something good out of a calamity. And in Joe E.'s case, this 10 year old, uh, or I know at, at that time he was 14, uh, uh, there's such, uh, the, there's fire and, and, and buildings destroyed. So all the grocery stores are telling people, the kids, well, take the food, you know. They get on a boat to Oakland, there are more people welcoming him. And, 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 and when Joey became a big hit in Hollywood, he wrote a little bio of himself that I, uh, 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 I, uh, uh, my first appearance in, in show business was being as a, uh, uh, an entertainer on a refugee train coming into Chicago, you know. So he, he winds up, he has a, a, a great skill as an acrobat, but he's also a good baseball player. And, and in terms of the connections, and you know, as you can see already, having just met me, I'm always looking for connections, and it's amazing where we can find them if we're open to them. Uh, the, uh, there's a fellow in Toledo when he comes home named Ali Picord. Ali Picord runs baseball teams. So he hires Joe as on a town ball and a semi-pro team. This Ali Bacord winds up being, uh, 10 years later, the, re the referee in the Jack Dempsey, Jess Willard fight. And in Brown's autobiography, which has the great, ta uh, should be republished called Laughter is a Wonderful Thing, uh, he talks about these amazing connections he made in his life. I mean, he, he actually got to, to meet both John L. Sullivan and, uh, and uh, Jim Corbett. And uh, he gets to know the Yankees, he gets to know Babe Ruth, he knew Huggins and uh, Miller Huggins, the manager of the Yankees, and Ed Barrow, the general manager, both knew uh, uh, Joey Brown and they invited him to spring training. They even wanted him to work out because, you know, an acrobat is, is a great athlete, you know, and, jo and Joey Brown for for almost his entire life, and he lived to be in his early 80s. I mean, he was 5'8 and 160, and, and the kids talked about, they couldn't, the two of them couldn't lift him. That, that, you know, that, you know, that's how strong he was. So I never really got to talk to Joe L. in detail about Joey, because it was clear to me that Joey, that Joe L. Brown left UCLA to go into baseball because he knew he wanted to go into baseball and he was going to, uh, I mean there were some connections through his father like uh, Joe L spent a teenage summer as Dizzy Dean's housemate in St. Louis and, and Dizzy Dean's wife said uh, now I have two teenagers with me this summer you know so he, he knew he through his father he knew baseball people but he left college to start from the lowest level, you know, and, and his father said, and, and he really meant it, that, that the, the, his greatest, he is as proud of what his son did um, uh, as much as anything or even more than, 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 than he ever did, you know. And so it's, uh, I'm very interested in movies and, uh, and, and baseball and, and, and how it reflects the culture, and I think Joey Brown is a uh, is a nice way to get at it, you know. Well, Joe E. Brown, well known for his slapstick and sort of the visuals that he had, and I I saw a reference effect that somehow you did some research on Buster Keaton as well. Well, yeah, Buster Keaton loved baseball. I mean, he uh, in fact he loved it so much that he. Uh, when he hired people for his production company, if they had the skills he needed, if they could play baseball, that was, that was a double check. Mm -hmm. And you know, Buster Keaton loved baseball so much that when he was working on his amazing films of the 20s, which was his heyday, I mean, I'm glad he lived to get acclaim later because you know, he uh, really hit the skids with the coming of sound and marital and alcohol problems, but he survived them all. But in his heyday of the 20s, he would, uh, if there was a, uh, a, uh, uh, a snag in production, and you know, he was blocked, a creative block, he just sort of, all right, we're gonna play baseball. And he'd take the, the, the group out, and they, uh, they, they would play, and after a couple uh, 
after a couple of uh, hours of that, he was refreshed and could go on with his work. Buster, too, like Joey Brown, they both were on the stage before they were 10 years old. Buster was in the family act. And, uh, and both Buster and Joey Brown really had harsh treatment from, from, well, Buster from his father who ran the show, Joey Brown from the people who ran the troops, you know. But uh, they, you know, baseball became that, not just a metaphor, it became a great, great relief, you know. And, uh, uh, and when they were both established in Hollywood, Brown on the way up in sound movies and Keaton on the way down, they, they would play benefit games uh, uh, and that became an annual event out there they uh, you know it's very hard to find this stuff you know the actual documentation but you know I uh, that's the the as you know from creating this wonderful center you know you just you know get on old clothes and start digging for it and they they played a benefit for the Los Angeles Olympics in 1932 uh, in LA because it was held in LA and then the annual uh, games between the actors and the comedians became a uh, uh, an, a, a big event uh, in, uh, in, in the Hollywood community. The best definition of sports you'd ever read was somebody who said you have to give it all you've got and you have to learn to take a beating. That was a student of mine. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up because I want to see if Tim Gary's still in Baltimore. I, we used to do sport autobiographies in, in class. I, I taught one of the first classes uh, in, in sport and American culture at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is in uh, Balt, uh, near Catonsville, or Butis to be exact. And we got some great works and this one student you know his father would take him out to play you got to give it all you got but you have to learn how to take a beating you know or or as the the best co-coaches today and the managers will say you've got to you got to accept defeat without being defeated and you've got to come back the next day you know what's the article that's sitting on your shelf waiting to be finished <laughs> well you really you asked some juicy ones well, you know, there's a lot more to be done on Joey Brown, actually. The one, Joey Brown, and even his granddaughter didn't know about this. Joey Brown, in, in 1939, testified in May, in late 1939, about bringing in 20,000 Jewish boys from Germany. Mm. And, it was, and it was one of these areas where there were a lot of... Uh, uh, it, it was a coalition of of the left and the right, and just a lot of humanitarians, and that's something that that really needs to be explored, you know, in in more depth. Because once once World War II came, I mean, before Bob Hope, he was entertaining troops all over the Pacific. Uh, he went to Alaska, and again, when he was uh, 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 in, in Bataan. I mean, he was everywhere. And Douglas MacArthur said that no one did more, no civilian did more for the war effort than Joey Brown. Now, his older son was killed in a civilian accident in October 42, which was the only time that Joey Brown, uh, the show didn't go on. He, he was playing the show off, uh, George Kelly's The Show Off. And he was playing it in, in Detroit, and the word came that his son had been killed in a civilian accident in Utah. And uh, I mean, and, and uh, there were some of his son's uh, um, uh, comrades in the army when the Air Force were there and they, uh, they, they went home and, and they buried him and he had already been doing work for the troops uh, overseas and now uh, I mean, he pledged that everyone was going to be like his son. I mean, you know, he really, uh, he deserves to be remembered because he, he never swore. He never swore on stage, you know. And, and he made it a point that he, when he was speaking to the troops that he said, I would never tell a joke that, that, that my mother couldn't hear. And from, from all things, uh, his mother was evidently quite a card, you know, but it was, it was clean humor. A lot of things about him in, in this age of, of such cynicism that I think needs to be remembered. But starting with that, that 1939 testimony, that, that uh, uh, how it happened and, you know, I mean, because I know he had been at the 36 Olympics in Germany. 
In fact, he was, again, and, and there may be footage of it, you know, he evidently was doing uh, a little uh, uh, a caricature of, uh, of Hitler uh, in the stands, you know. Hmm. Mention the name Joey Brown these days, and probably the only item that comes to mind is the last line he delivered in Billy Wilder's classic 1959 film, Some Like It Hot. Talk about that. Well, he's playing Osgood Fielding the third. And th this is the, uh, uh, the film about where Jack Lemmon and uh, Tony Curtis are eyewitness to a gang shooting in Chicago. I mean, around the St. Saint Valentine's Day massacre. And the only way, they've, they've seen the shooting, so the only way they can get out is to um, uh, put on women's disguises and become uh, mem uh, members of an all-girl band. And so Marilyn Monroe is the singer in the band. And so there are all kinds of complications. They land up in, in, in Miami or somewhere in, deep in Florida. And um, uh, Tony Curtis really has the hots for Marilyn Monroe. So he plays both a, a rich yachtsman and uh, someone acting like women in the band. And Joey Brown, as Osgood, Osgood uh, Fielding III, falls in love with Jack, Jack Lemon. And uh, they're getting away finally at the end. And, and you know, there's a reprise uh, of the gangster films with George Raft appearing and uh, Pat O'Brien. And they get away from them at the banquet uh, in Florida where, the, where uh, Raft is going to get uh, killed and or they're going to try to kill him. And they do, actually. And so they get into the boat at the end of the film, and uh, Osgood is, is all excited about he's going to marry uh, Josephine. And um, so uh, Jack Lemon is saying, you know, I smoke, you know, I mean, oh, that's all right, you know. And finally says, we can't marry because I'm a man. And he takes the wig off. And Joey Brown very serenely says, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> I called Mama. She was so happy she cried. She wants you to have our wedding gown. It's white lace. Yeah, that's good. I can't get married in your mother's dress. <laughs> she and I, we are not built the same way. We can have it altered. Yeah, I know you don't. That's good. I'm good of level with you. We can't get married at all. Why not? Well, in the first place, I'm not a natural blonde. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I smoke. I smoke all the time. I don't care. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. Uh, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. And, and, you know, I've read a lot about Wilder, who, who loved baseball. In fact, more connections here that will have to be explored. Jo Joey Brown ran into Wilder at a Dodger game, the L.A. Dodgers. And, you know, I probably couldn't get as, as deeply involved in this if, if I had been a Brooklyn Dodger fan, but I wasn't, you know. And Joey Brown had actually gone, gone, gone out and spoken for the committee to make the Shavaz Ravine deal happen so uh, Walter Malley could get his dream stadium built on land from the city. So they meet at one of the Dodger games, and they remember the old days. And Wilder thought it would be great for Brown to be cast in this character because, it, you know, he was playing a little bit against type. I mean, because Brown was always a good-natured buffoon and egotistical in the movies of the 30s, you know. But if you look at those movies closely, he also he had a tremendous range. Uh, I mean, he was a good actor, you know. And so uh, Wilder cast Brown. In fact, the story is that Braft, who he knew from the 30s, uh, Raft and Wild and uh, Joey Brown were calling themselves the utility infielders <laughs> on a cast with Monroe and Curtis and Lemon, you know, and so th that that's how how this came to be, and that was his really last great moment in the sun. You know, it is amazing how, you know, baseball is the uh, uh, the ball is round, the bat is round, and you have to hit it square. 
I mean, it's just, it's a game of contradictions, but it's a game of joy, you know? And, and it's uh, all these people, I mean, that I, that I study, I, I, I like to bring that out, you know? And, uh, and the, the line of Ricky that I, that I discovered after I did my book, but I've gotten it in other uh, discussions, is that when he won the World Series with the Cardinals and beating Connie Mack, 1931, Pepper Martin, who was his favorite player, because he is, he was as is, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the writers said about Ricky is that he had the face of a deacon, the manners of a diplomat, and he could get in and out of your pockets without mussing a hair. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you, Lee. This is spectacular. What a bonus. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to, to talk to people who understand and care.